Okay, this video is a book review of the book Alzheimer's Explained by Danton O'Day. Here's what the book cover looks like. Uh, Danton O'Day is an Irish-English guy who is a professor in Canada, and his research focuses on calmodulin. Calmodulin is about 150 amino acid long protein inside the cytoplasm of neurons. It's highly conserved across multiple different animals, and that's what he believes is the best explanation for Alzheimer's. He's been researching this for a couple of decades. Um, the book is well written. It's sort of written to an audience, you would say, at the level of a high IQ layperson. So he does explain everything pretty well for somebody who's new to the material. Um, you know, he's a university professor guy. So he's going to give you all the standard conventional information. He goes through the standard conventional uh, beta amyloid and phosphorylated tau protein hypotheses. That's sort of like the popular one with big pharma. Okay, he then describes these, you know, sort of a playful pun. The, the beta amyloid protein is the Baptist theory. The tau protein, phosphorylated tau protein, is the Taoist theory. So some people say, what's the difference between the Baptist and the Taoist theory? It's kind of a joke. Okay, so anyways, he has good pictures to illustrate what people are talking about with BAP is beta amyloid protein, you know, the ones with 40 and 42 amino acids, especially 42 amino acids are supposed to be the most troublesome version of beta amyloid. Um, he's got good discussion of stuff that's not as easy to find everywhere, like the biomarkers for Alzheimer's, all the genetic uh, vulnerabilities to Alzheimer's. So that is all well and good. Um... Oh, I, as far as nutrition is concerned, he absolutely is ignorant on nutrition. He sort of vaguely says, you know, a balanced diet, Mediterranean diet, and DASH and Mayo Clinic diets are sound like reasonably good ways to go. He doesn't go into much detail about diet, but I can just tell you, you know, people think the Mayo Clinic is a respectable institution. And for some things it is, okay? They do have a lot of smart people in some of the highly specialized surgical fields and radiology fields. But when it comes to nutrition and disease prevention, they stink, man. They, they're pathetic. They may, they're like, they, they're worthless, okay, as are most universities, okay. I've seen their courses, okay. You know, you can go to like Cleveland Clinic. They got, you know, the genius Esselstein who figures out how to cure coronary artery disease, but they don't hire him. Instead, <laughs> they promote what I would consider nonsense diets. Okay, anyways, uh, beta amyloid protein, senile plaque, uh, it's primarily extracellular. It occurs earlier than does tau, okay? But the bottom line is tau and beta amyloid theories. And, uh, you know, Danton O'Day, he points this out as well. They happen too late in the course of the disease. They are not the cause of the disease. And it's not even clear how significant they are. You know, the kind of beta amyloid protein does get in the middle of all kinds of problems with Alzheimer's. And tau does, you know, has some correlation to the amount of cognitive decline. But... They're late problems, okay? And all the drug trials to change them really haven't done anything significant. So I think they're barking up the wrong tree with beta amyloid and tau. And actually, Danton O'Day would agree with that. He thinks the calmodulin uh, intracellular calcium binding protein you know, enzyme is the most important thing. And I would actually say he's right that calmodulin, this enzyme down here, it's in the middle of everything. And that's all well and good. But here's the problem with that. That occurs late. That's like, you know, you're playing basketball and one team's already ahead by 30 points, so they put all their scrubs in, garbage time, and they're already going to win the game. It doesn't really matter what happens in the last five minutes, okay? So what I'm trying to say is what really matters in figuring out dementia causation is the earlier events that lead to all the other problems, okay? So I think this book is helpful for anybody who's trying to get a better understanding of the different theories of Alzheimer's, the different perspectives, the different roles that all these components play in it. Beta amyloid, phosphorylated tau, the concept of protein misfold, misfolding disorders. And I do like the way he alludes to the prion situation, even though he doesn't go into much, he doesn't really go into it hardly at all, the concept of switching from uh, you know, an alpha helix to a uh, beta pleated sheep. But... That's all well and good. He does a good job at debunking the infection theories for Alzheimer's. Some people would propose that, well, Alzheimer's is really just Lyme disease or, you know, combinations Lyme, syphilis, uh, herpes simplex virus, reactivation, toxoplasmosis. And those things may play a small contributory role. And there are some cases of Lyme disease like Chris Christopherson, the singer, where he got treated for Lyme and he got better. So, yes, these diseases can sometimes progress to dementia. That is certainly true. 
but they're not the bread and butter common version of it that you see all day long every day if you work with neurology type patients, okay? All right, now notice one thing he says here. Danton O'Day says this on page 13. No one truly understands what causes Alzheimer's dementia. What starts, what starts out the causation of Alzheimer's dementia remains a mystery. We can't expect to find a cure until we understand why it occurs. And to me, that's like a major red flag right there. That is what all the medical books say about all the common diseases. No one knows what causes it. We're trying to find out. Give us more money. In the meantime, take this drug. Maybe it'll help. Okay, that's, you know, BS how you sell a drug. Okay, there's actually a lot of good information about what causes dementia. And like I said, in my experience, 95% of the patients have diabetes or hypertension and 90% of them have both of those, okay? Most of the demented brains I look at, they got at least one cataract surgery, poor dentition, and they're diabetic and hypertensive. Uh, let's see what else. He mentions the cognitive reserve hypothesis. That's like came out of the Notre Dame nun study in Mankato, Minnesota, that the nuns that were more academic were less likely to develop Alzheimer's, even if they had a lot of beta amyloid plaques in their brains. Uh, so basically what that says is build up your intellect and study a lot and read a lot and have intellectual conversations and write if you can, and you'll be less likely to develop Alzheimer's because you've got so much cognitive reserve, meaning that even if you destroy a lot of intellectual neurons, you still got a whole bunch left compared to somebody who just sits around watching TV all day. Okay, fine. Um, let's see, what else? Um, he doesn't even mention Jack Delatorre's theory. I thought that was a major, major oversight. How could you not mention Delatorre's theory, which is the best one out of all of them? That is the most useful concept to get. Chronic cerebral hyperperfusion, the mouse equivalent theory, also called the vascular hypothesis of Alzheimer's. You know, O'Day, I give him credit. He does talk about that, you know, hypertensive and diabetes contribute to it. But I think the deletory theory is the best thing to lock into a person's mind, a mechanism of Alzheimer's causation. Okay, and I think the next best theory is my theory. And my theory is not published in the journal articles. It's only published in my books and on my videos. Because, you know, I work full time. And when I try to publish stuff in the journal articles, it takes so much time. And they reject everything practically I submit. So, anyways, neurovascular uncoupling. What I like about my theory and why I think it's the second best one after deletorious, it tells you exactly what to do. You know, deletorious theory tells you, be careful, avoid hypertension, diabetes, congestive heart failure, and AFib, okay? But deletorious, he doesn't know anything about nutrition or toxicology, uh, whereas my unique position in this game is I know a lot about nutrition and toxicology and epidemiology, and I've educated myself on EMF. We'll talk about that in a moment. Um, so neurovascular uncoupling, it tells you to be a low-fat, low-sodium vegan, avoid MSG, all these stimulants, because they're excitotoxins, traumatic brain injury, ischemia, EMF is also the equivalent of an excitotoxin, the leaky gut, so all these things, and it tells you exactly what to do, the mitochondria inhibitors and circuit inhibitors essentially end up having the same effect as excitotoxins, therefore you want to avoid all of them, all right, and like I said, the standard pre-med med school textbook will not give you any mitochondrial inhibitors, whereas I give you about 45 of them and tell you, you know, 30 of them are common. Circa inhibitors, there's a whole bunch of those. Your food dies, you know, anything that smells bad. Okay, um, so, you know, my goal is to help people, you know, to save their health and to teach them how to help themselves. What I see happening with a typical researcher, for a researcher, the goal most of the time, it seems to me, is to try to come up with a therapeutic drug because that way you can get more funding. But the problem is, as anybody who really knows a lot about medicine knows, drugs don't work. They almost never do. Very few drugs are really good for anything and worth taking at all. They're good when you replace something. You're missing thyroid hormone, fine, take thyroid hormone. You got Parkinson's and you're not able to compensate for it, you know, take the L-Dopa or the other drug, whatever. But, you know, this idea of always looking for a drug makes them forget to look for other things, okay? And they don't even bother to learn nutrition, toxicology, epidemiology, and EMF, the typical PhD. And that's why they, they usually can't put things together. Now, this guy, Martin Paul, I think he's a genius. He did an incredible job of really going through all the literature with regard to these rare diseases like multiple chemical sensitivities, electrical hypersensitivity syndrome, PTSD, um, and he did a great job on tinnitus, tinnitus. What's unique about Martin Paul is he's both a physicist and sort of a, a, a student of biology. So he's able to put things together and he knows the math. So he was great on EMF. He's the best guy out there on EMF. I mean, other people have written good books or good papers on it. 
you know, like Martin Blank's written good papers on the fractal antenna theory of DNA and why it gets uh, damaged by EMF, but Martin Paul is kind of awesome on that. I've recently reviewed his book uh, called Explaining Unexplained Illness, and he does go into quite a bit of detail about the no oh no theory of nitric oxide and peroxynitrite, and he also is great on the concept of digital dementia, so he's really good on all these things. You want to talk about a guy with sort of a narrow range of emotion, he seems like sort of a classic Asperger, okay? But I think Martin Paul is a heroic genius, okay, for what he did researching all the stuff in these rare diseases. But he's still, you know, kind of a narrow PhD in the sense that he doesn't know anything about nutrition. Um, he doesn't know toxicology. Uh, but he does know EMF. He knows EMF better than anyone else, and that's a really important topic. Okay, Douglas Kell and Estheresia Pretoria series. So I'd, get, I'd make this, because I'm going through these series. Number one, deletory. Number two, the Peter Rogers MD theory and neurovascular uncoupling for explaining dementia. Number three is the Martin Paul theory of the no-oh-no concept, nitric oxide peroxynitrite theory. The number four theory I would rank it is Douglas Kell and Estheresia Pretoria's PhDs and their leaky gut dormant bacteria theory. Okay, and they also tie that in with psychological stress with the catecholamines, adrenaline, noradrenaline functioning as siderophores. Sidero meaning iron, four meaning the transfer, facilitating the transfer of iron to the dormant bacteria to reactivate them. So they release LPS, lipopolysaccharide, which causes amyloidogenic clotting of the blood. Um, the stress also increases fibrinogen, and you get breakdown of the blood-brain barrier, and you get... Uh, this abnormal clotting, the fibrinogen fibrin extending across the blood-brain barrier, uh, causing uh, you know more precipitation of beta amyloids, and um, that's very interesting. He does a good job explaining the prion mechanisms of uh, beta amyloid, and it's interesting how beta amyloid can do things like a prion. You know, one of them becoming insoluble, oligomers are becoming insoluble. It can start having effects on the plasma membrane of a neuron. It can create its own. Uh, calcium channel pore. It can increase the activity of like the store channels um, to get more calcium to go in the endoplasmic reticulum. It can cause increased permeability, increased activity of the NMDA receptor to let more calcium into the cell. Um, it especially activates the subtype of the NMDA receptors called the, when they have a subunit uh, called the NR2B, and that lets in lots and lots of calcium. Speaking of letting calcium into the cell, Martin Paul made the point that when you've got you know, chronic uh, abnormal EMF, you can have chronic opening of your VGCCs, your voltage-gated calcium channels, to let more calcium into the cell, and that can be open for a prolonged amount of time, thus having a lot, a lot, a lot of uh, calcium entry into the cell. So I thought he was great at pointing that out. Okay, uh, so then comes Danton O'Day. Uh, PhD, the author of this book, Alzheimer Explained, and his what he puts forth as the main theory of 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 dementia, Alzheimer's dementia, is the calcium calmodulin theory, and of course he's right that calmodulin is in the center of everything. He's absolutely right about that, and he does a nice job of showing that and making diagrams of that. I think that's all great, but. I think these other theories are better because they start earlier in the causative pathway. You need to know the earlier causative events in order to know how to avoid them and protect your health. So I do think Danton O'Day is good. I think he's a smart guy. I think he's a good guy. I think his heart's in the right place. That is all well and good. And I think I know why he kind of hangs out with the calcium calmodulin theory because that's an area where you got potential to make therapeutic drugs and you can get more funding and all your papers will get funded and so you'll be popular with the university, you'll be popular with the funding, you know, uh, big pharma money and all that. So that's all good. And I think he means, well, I think he just never bothered to study nutrition because it's of no value if you're trying to make a drug uh, or toxicology. So that's where I think he's at on that. Tetsumori Yamashima He's a Japanese MD PhD guy who, you know, put forth the theory that omega six cooking oils were the main reason Japanese people had an increase in incidence of dementia. And his theory extends into lipid peroxidation, toxic aldehydes like hydroxynon and all the calpain cathepsin destruction of heat shock protein seventy theory, uh, which then leads to lysosomal uh, degradation and release of lysosomal enzymes into the cytoplasm of the neuron, thus leading to auto digestion and destruction of the neuron. And the bottom line you learn from him is don't eat omega-6 cooking oils ever. <laughs> they also increase your risk of diabetes and obesity, etc. 
Okay, then there's a whole bunch of different, you know, theories about heavy metals contributing to cognitive impairment and dementia and F minus as well. And that's all well and good. All of these things are mitochondria inhibitor. And, and as I explained in my neurovascular coupling theory, avoid all the, neuro, the mitochondria inhibitors. And there's tons of them. Like I said, I, I, I cataloged over 45 of them and about 30 of them are common. So anyways, yes, I do think this book, Alzheimer's Explained, is worth reading by Danton O'Day. Uh, but I think he sort of like does a good job of giving you the background material. But I think he's screwing up because he doesn't mention deletory. That's a giant oversight in my opinion. I'm not surprised he doesn't know about me, but he does now probably he'll hear about this video and that'll motivate him to read. He doesn't know anything about Paul, Martin Paul, which is awesome stuff. Doesn't know Douglas Calv and Pretorius. And these are major players in this whole business and Yamashima, major stuff. So anyways, I think this is a nice component of educating oneself about uh, dementia, but I do really think that the big, well, the big three are Delatore, myself, and Martin Paul for telling you how to keep yourself healthy and what to do, and also Douglas Kell. You don't want leaky gut. Anything that opens up the gut barrier tends to open up the blood-brain barrier as well, so you want to avoid those things. And these other things, they're all good. They're all relevant, so it's good to know all of them, you know, but uh, anyways, for what it's worth, there it is. Thank you.